time for us to begin. Shortly we'll have a scripture reading taken from Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. Gospel meetings starting today, Collinsville and Arnold. In Collinsville, Wesley Hazel is speaking. In Arnold, Eric Owens. And then on April 26th through the 28th, Terry Mabry. Friday, April 26, we have the area-wide singing that we'll be hosting here. And we need refreshments, finger foods, desserts, and drinks. Ladies' Day at Pacific on Saturday, April 27th at 9 a.m. Annual Trivia Night will be here Saturday, May 11th. And more details will follow. Third Annual Show Me State Lectureship at Branson, Sunday, May 26th through Sunday, June 2nd. Our sympathies on the prayer list go to the Lowry family and the passing of Joni last Monday. Merle Walker um, has been diagnosed with pneumonia, Betty Joe's brother-in-law, so please keep him in your prayers. Cindy Derryberry, Sharon's daughter, will have an MRI on Wednesday to determine further treatments. Sue Barnes will undergo oral chemo and radiation treatment for precancerous cells that were found in a lymph node. And Serenity Simmons, Jamie's four-year-old cousin, is at Fraser Rehab in Louisville for the next week or two. Opportunities to serve. I didn't get a chance to check the list, but there's probably a few opportunities left for the mowing list. Uh, make sure you get signed up for that. Larry's trying to get his name on every week, but um, I think it'd be good if we give him a break. <coughs> Potter Children's Home, there are coin cans that are available in the foyer, and those will be picked up in September. So grab one of those, save your coins, and uh, in several months you'll have that filled up, and they will be here in September to pick it up. The bear program, 157 bears were taken to area hospitals and urgent care centers on Monday, and the staff wanted to make sure that everyone who participates in that program know how much uh, that was appreciated. And congratulations goes to Brandon Foster for graduating from the Nashville School of Preaching and Biblical Studies, and that ceremony was yesterday. We'll now begin with our scripture reading. Again, that's Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call, upon, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. First song tonight will be number 883, Seek Ye First. Sing all three stanzas. <coughs> Seek ye first of
gone before our opening prayer this evening will be number 627. 627, Joyland 1. <clears throat> I fear the weight of pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this night to thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you, Father, for the beauties of life that we see about us in your handiwork, the changing of the seasons, and it lets us know that you're still in control of everything. We're thankful, Father, for your power, for your uh, love and kindness that you extend to us each day. We thank you for the mercies that we enjoy, that you sustain us with everything in life we need and even more. Help us always to use these to glorify your name. Father, we pray for our loved ones and families that are suffering this night with loss of loved ones that need healing in their lives, that need comforting. We pray, Father, that you bless them according to your will. But we know that you know their needs better than even we know how to ask. We thank you, Father, for your son and for the blessings that we enjoy through his sacrifices. We pray now that you'd help us to prepare our minds for uh, understanding of your word as it's pre presented this night. Help us to try to stay in that way that leads to that heavenly home. But we also know that we fail sometimes and we get off of our course. Help us to have the presence of mind to see our mistakes, to truly turn from them, and ask for the forgiveness you promise. Go with us through the rest of this hour and the rest of the coming week that we might be strong and faithful, that we realize that fate, Satan will be at every turn in our lives trying to take us off course. Help us always to turn to you and your word for the power we need to resist him. Forgive us, Father, where we have fallen short. We ask these blessings in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Next song this evening will be number 898, Under the Old Law, 898. Sing all three stanzas. <coughs> Under the Old Law.
of invitation for using your books is number 31, almost persuaded. Psalm before Brother Jerry's lesson this evening will be number 523, Our God, He is Alive. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanza. If you're willing and able, if you would, please stand for this song. 523. There is the army. In our classes and in our sermons, and I've also noticed even in our devotionals on Wednesday evening, that the lessons have been geared toward the devil, sin, and hell. And so for these few months from March through May, uh, that's what you're going to be hearing evidently from every lesson. Well, certainly in our classes, but also from our sermons and our devotionals as well. And, of course, you do understand that there are many things that could be noticed, and certainly in our class sessions, that uh, the time, of course, does not permit us to do all that. But we'll be covering, and Joe and Dan and I will be covering uh, most of the stuff that we need to be looking at um, pertaining to that subject. This morning, we remind ourselves of the fact that the Bible does point out to us, of course, what sin is. It describes to us sin, and you know the four verses. Uh, hopefully, when we get through this series of lessons, you're going to remember those four verses uh, because you're going to hear them often. Romans 14, 23, what there is not a faith is sin. James 4, 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him, it is sin. And then in 1 John 3, 4, John points out that all uh, that transgression of the law is sin. That simply means going beyond what God has bound. And then in 1 John 5, verse 17, John points out that all unrighteousness 
is sin. We know from Psalms 119 and verse 172 that righteousness is the commandments of God. And therefore, when we fail to keep the commandments of God, then that is unrighteousness. And so those are the four basic verses that tell us what sin is. Because it says, is sin in all four of those verses. As I mentioned this morning, that it is evident that we can sin in certainly many various ways. And we have uh, described and we have talked about some of those things in some of our sermons. But also realizing that we do sin whenever we believe or whenever we practice or whenever we proclaim that which is contrary to the will of God. And it happens that many of the so-called popular doctrines, if you will, with man are based upon a misunderstanding of God and of his will. And so sometimes people will blurt out something. They say, well, you know, I, I know God says this, and I know how God feels about this, and I know this is right because this is what God desires and so forth. And then when the question is asked, well, how do you know for sure? Well, I, it has to be in the Bible somewhere. I, I've heard it all my life, so it has to be there. And I, 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 I just believe and I'm just convinced that that is true. And yet when we examine the scripture, we do see that many of the so-called popular doctrines among men are not based upon the word of God. Therefore, we need to understand that when we believe something or we teach something or we practice something that is contrary to the word of God, then that is sin. And that will cause our soul to be in a lost condition. And so it is imperative that we make sure that what we do believe, teach, and practice is certainly based upon the Word of God. We began to notice this morning a couple of so-called popular doctrines with man that certainly shows that there is a misunderstanding in reference to God. The first one we notice is this idea that, you know, one church is good as another. You, you just attend the church of your choice. And really, that's what God desires. God wants to give man choices in reference to what religious group that, that man wants to belong to. And besides that, that's how God has set it up. God has told this group here to believe and teach and practice certain things. He's told this group here to believe and teach and practice certain things that are different than what he's told the other group. And so on down the line you go to a thousand different groups and God has told them to believe and teach and practice certain things that are specific to those particular groups. Therefore, when you get concerned about religious matters, you can search around, you can find a group that believes, teaches, and practices things you want to believe, teach, and practice. And so God has made it easy on you to pick and choose. And so they blame this division from a religious standpoint upon God. And yet God, we know, is not responsible for the religious division that does exist in our world. If we believe, teach, and practice what the Bible, what the Bible teaches, then we will believe in teach and practice the same. But the problem is, many times people's minds are blinded by tradition. It is blinded by their, what is popular. It is blinded by many different things. And so they fail to look at closely what the Bible does teach. And we know in Psalms 133 and verse 1, 
The psalmist declared, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We know how Paul, in addressing some of the problems in the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, deals with this matter of division. That God desires that all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. I know in that passage he's referring to the church of our Lord. And I understand that. But the principle is the same. That in, in religious matters, we must be united. And when you read in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul points out how unity can be had. It's something that we must work at, that it does not just happen. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, Paul says, in the bond of peace. That's so it's something that must be worked at. It's something that must be maintained. But we cannot have unity with one that does not believe what the Bible says, that does not teach what the Bible says, and that does not practice what the Bible says. And so to blame God for denominationalism is a misunderstanding, of course, of God himself. And the second thing we began to notice this morning is this matter of an it's popular in, in, in certain circles, and yet sometimes people will claim to believe this, and yet when you question them about it, they really don't believe it. But it sounds good, and that is universalism. And that teaching is simply that everyone is going to be saved. No matter what they believe, no matter what they teach, no matter what they practice. Now, where does that come from? It comes from a misunderstanding of God. God is so loving. God is so gracious. God is so merciful that God will not send anyone to that horrible place called hell. It is against, some would claim, it's against the very nature, the very essence, the very attributes of God for anyone to be cast into hell. It is tragic that people view God only from the standpoint of his love. Now certainly God is all loving. Romans 5 and verse 8, 1 John 4 and verse 8, of course, John 3, 16. A few verses that talk about and present to us the love of God. And we know how broad it is. It is as broad as a human race because God loves all. And yet this ideal, God is so loving that he will not send anyone to hell. Therefore, they conclude that everyone is going to be saved. I wished I could believe that doctrine. I wish it was true that everyone's going to be saved. But I can't believe that because it is not taught in Scripture. Note, please. And when people say, well, they believe everybody's going to be saved no matter what. And then you ask this question. What about the person who denies God? You believe they're going to be saved? On one hand, they say everybody's going to be saved. What about the person who denies God? Will they be saved? In reality, when a person says that everybody's going to be saved, then it must be a fact, according to that reasoning, that 
there cannot be any conditions, not one, to being saved. Let's look at it this way. The, does the Bible, and that's what we're focusing on, isn't it? That's what we're looking at. Does the Bible say anything about whether or not a person is going to be saved that denies God or that does not know God? The Bible says anything about that. I, I know the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And so the person who says there is no God, then certainly we understand he's foolish. But is there a passage in the Bible that lets us know that those who do not know God, those who deny God, are not going to be saved? Let me direct your attention to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And in that passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in talking about the return of the Lord with his angels, it says in flaming fire, now notice, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Now, if it is the case that everyone's going to be saved, then that must mean that even those who deny God, those who don't know God, are going to be saved as well. If not, then we have to give up that belief that everyone's going to be saved. And so Paul reminds us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that those who do not know God are going to be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. A person with an open mind, open heart, with an honest heart cannot read that passage and conclude that those who do not know God, those who even deny God, are going to be saved anyway. Because Paul makes it very clear. And so when a person denies God, it is impossible for them to be saved. And therefore, the doctrine that everybody's going to be saved cannot be true. Just on that one point. But let me add something else here. What if a person desires not to be saved? Are they going to be saved anyway? Let me direct your attention to show you that a person, in order to be saved, must have the desire to be saved. Now, we understand that the desire in and of itself does not mean that a person is saved, but they cannot be saved without first having the desire to be saved. It's not going to happen. Because God does not save anyone against their own will. God does not do that. How do I know that? John 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, and let's notice, we're going to put some verses here together. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Now, if we're going to come unto the Father, it has to be, of course, by or through Jesus Christ himself. 
because he is that way. In fact, the one and only way. And that's what he means there when he uses those three terms there. I am the way, the truth, the life. Notice that definite article, the. He's saying, I am the one and only. Not talking about I am a way, a truth, a life, but I am the one and only. And so if anyone is to come unto the Father, it must be by and through me. Notice that expression, come unto the Father. Does that happen just by accident? No. Now let's connect that. You know, if we're going to come unto the Father, it must be by and through Jesus Christ himself. In Matthew chapter 11, and verses 28 through 30, we have what I refer to as the invitation of the Lord. And what does he say? He says, come unto me. Notice, come unto me. That is suggesting to us that of desire. Come unto me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall not rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now notice Jesus said, if you're going to come unto the Father, or if you're going to reach the Father, it has to be through me. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, come unto me. Does that just happen? No. Because in that invitation, notice what it says. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That is active on man's part. I desire to come unto the Father. And I understand it has to be through the Jesus Christ himself. And so I must come to him. But in order to come to him, in doing so, I learn of him. That is not passive. That is action on my part. But in order to do that, it takes desire to do that. Now you couple that with John chapter 5. You remember in John chapter 5, the text there, Jesus is talking about how that people could know who he was. And he's giving forth proof and evidence that he is the Son of God. He talks about his Father. He talks about the miracles that he did, the works that he did. He talked about John the Baptist. And he even talked about the Scripture. You know the verse, John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life, and they are that which testify of me. Of course, the scriptures testify of me. My father has done that. John the Baptist has done that. And look at the works that I have done. They testify who I am. I have been sent by my father. Then in verse 40, John chapter 5, after giving that evidence, that proof, who he was, Jesus said, and ye will not come unto me, that ye might have life. What if a person desires not to come unto Jesus? In other words, come to him in obedience. Well, that means he's not accepting his invitation. That means he can't come unto the Father. And notice also in John 5, 40, when he said, And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, if you want to have life, you must have the desire, if you will, to come to me. 
because I am the way, the truth, the life. So when a person said, well, I, I, I don't desire to, to, to have salvation. I don't desire to have it, but I know I'm going to be okay with God. Now, where did you read that? Well, I know you didn't read it in the Bible. And so when we talk about a person being saved, if a person does not desire to be saved, they're not going to be saved. So is it true that everybody's going to be saved? No. How do I know? Because some are going to deny God, and some have. And those who do so cannot be saved. Is everybody going to be saved? No. How do I know that? Because everyone is not going to desire to be saved. Jesus said, and ye will not come to me that you might have life. But some don't desire it. But desire is demanded. What if a person devises their own plan? I want to be saved. So I, I come up with this plan by which I can be saved by God. Are they going to be saved? Now, if everybody's going to be saved, then you have to say, yes, they have to be. But is that true? Based on Scripture. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Paul writing says brethren my heart's desire to God for Israel is that they might be saved for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Some key words in this passage that we have to understand. Paul says, My heart's desire is for all of Israel to be saved. Then he makes this statement. For I bear them record. But they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now when Paul said, my prayer is that all Israel be saved. Are they going to be saved? And when Paul says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Is he saying that they're going to be saved even though they don't have a knowledge? No. He said their problem is they have a zeal. The zeal is there, but the knowledge is not. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying for them to be saved, understand there has to be a knowledge there. But they don't have it. A knowledge of what? A knowledge of God's righteousness. And he says they've gone about to establish their own righteousness. In other words, here's their own plan. And because they have gone about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, to understand... Those verses. Let me remind you again. The word righteousness in the book of Romans. How it is basically used. It is basically used in the book of Romans to have reference to God's plan. God's way. 
God's means by which he, God, declares sinful man righteous. Now, who has the power to declare us to be righteous? God does. What is that means by which he does that? It is by and through his plan. What is that plan? Romans chapter 1. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Notice, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek. Verse 17. For, for, he's connecting now what he's about to say with what he just said. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. Verse 16. Verse 17, he says, For therein, therein, referring back to the gospel, for therein, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so in Romans chapter 10, Paul says, my prayer is for Israel that they be saved. I bear them record they have a zeal of God but it's not according to knowledge. They are ignorant of God's righteousness. They don't know God's righteousness. They have set up their own righteousness. That is, they have set up their own plan by which they can be righteous in the sight of God. And Paul says, when they did that, they did not submit unto the righteousness of God. Now, if it is the case, and it is, the only way that we can be declared righteous, justified, saved by God is if we submit to the righteousness of God, that is, we submit to God's plan, which is the gospel of Christ. We don't do that. We set up our own plan. We devise our own plan. So you're telling me that people who do that that they're going to be saved anyway? If that, be, if, that, if that is the case, why did Paul say what he said here in Romans chapter 10? Why pray for them to be saved? If they're going to be saved anyway. Why pray for them to be saved? Because they're looking to something other than God's plan of righteousness. This matter that everybody is going to be saved. It stands in opposition to who God is, to God's will, to God's plan. Now, God desires all men to be saved. Yes. But there is the way, the plan, the means by which that must be done. God is loving, yes. And he desires all to be saved. But all will not be saved. And it's not God's fault when that occurs God loves all his grace has been extended to all Titus 2 verse 11 and all have been invited to come and to reap and to be blessed by him but we have to make that choice There are a lot of other doctrines we may look at some other time and in reference to how people misunderstand God. For example, the mourner's bench system of religion. I grew up in a religious group that believed that, and probably I, some of you did too. 
or you know something about this, the martyr's bench system of religion. And it's basically saying that God certainly loves you, but God is reluctant to save. You know, this is weird. A lot of times the people who believe that God is reluctant to save also believe that everybody's going to be saved. Now, wait a minute. You know, I, I may... I, I may be from, from Kentucky, and that may be a bad thing in the minds of some people, but, but I know those two things, that, that, that doesn't match up, okay? That doesn't match up. And that's why I'm telling you that a lot of religious people that I know, they basically are going by what they hear the preachers say anyway. And they're not spending the time they should with the book, with the Bible, and and that's why we have so much confusion in the religious world. Think about the doctrine that is so popular among some, and that is the impossibility of apostasy. What is that tied to? That's tied to a misunderstanding about God, God's power. Because they'll point out to you, well, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And Peter points out that we are kept by the power of God. Right there it says, we're kept, we're guarded by the power of God, therefore we cannot be lost. Is that what the verse says? No. It does say we're kept by the power of God, but notice it says through faith. That's a big difference. Do you not also understand that, for example, racism comes from a misunderstanding of God and what God has done? There's so many beliefs, and they're all tied to a misunderstanding of God. In Isaiah 55, now reading this evening, Isaiah writes, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And then he emphasized, Let the wicked forsake his ways and, and the evil man his thoughts. And let him return unto him, and he will abundantly pardon. He will have mercy upon you. Does that sound like someone who is hesitant or reluctant to save? It's not. God stands ready to save anyone who will come to him on his terms. Now it's evident that salvation there is a divine side and there is a human side. If salvation was only tied to the divine side, then everyone would be saved. Because God desires all men to be saved. He doesn't desire anyone to be lost. But his plan demands that mankind make a choice, make a decision. And we can choose to be saved or we can choose to stay in our lost condition. People are lost because of sin. The solution to that is the gospel, which is God's power unto salvation. And therefore, the gospel must be faithfully proclaimed. And when we see that being faithfully proclaimed, and we see man listening to that message, and heeding and accepting that message, and applying it to their life, 
then they become what God wants them to become. And they can begin to live in hope of eternal life. And thanks be to God that he's made that available and made that possible. This evening, as Jamie's is about to lead us in this song, a song of encouragement. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, the time to do that is this evening. If you're come believing in the Lord and repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ and be baptized, the Lord will save you. You don't have to beg. You don't have to plead. You don't have to cry out to him. He's ready to save. He's not reluctant. Tragically, man is sometimes reluctant to be saved by God. But God is ready. And everything is ready. If you need to do that this evening, we encourage you to do so. If you need to come as a child of God who has sinned, then we encourage you to come and make things right so you can leave being justified by God and you can stand justified as long as you live a faithful and dedicated life. Why not come as good as we stand and as we sing? do not have the opportunity to take of the Lord's Supper this morning, you'll be offered that if you, as we sing number 726, we'll sing all four stanzas. If you'll come forward and be seated on either the front pews, you will be heard. 726, we shall be done. <coughs> we shall be done with
Dear loving Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your representative on this photo to take the resemblance of Father to Son and Lord to suggest his step was truly divine and should be remembered for Christians and devoted new friends to return our thoughts to the most beloved one. Now we ask your blessing as we take these next as we share the bright moment and we may his death, burial, and resurrection as we all share the same. Closing song this evening will be number 884. Teach me, Lord, the way of truth. Both stanzas, if you're willing and able to stand, if you would please stand for this song and remain standing for our closing prayer. 884. <coughs> Teach me, Lord, to Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day, and we thank you for the many blessings that, that you bestow upon us, and we, we thank you for this opportunity to meet here today and to worship you, to study your word and sing praises to you. Father, we thank you for the lessons that were brought to us, and Father, we pray that we would all uh, make a strong effort and diligently seek you and uh, use the things that we learn in our everyday lives. We pray that we always live in accordance with your will. And Father, we pray that everything that was said and done here today has been in accordance with your will. Father, we pray again for those of our number who are sick and have physical problems. We pray that you would be with the doctors who are treating them, and we pray if it be your will, you would restore them to good health. Father, we thank you for this country we live in, and Father, we pray that you would be with the leaders of our country, that they would see the need to turn to you for guidance. Father, we pray for our men and women in the military, that you'd watch over and protect them. Father, we pray for our men and women in law enforcement who 
who serve us. We pray that you would watch over and protect them also. Father, we pray as we leave here that we will leave our lives, live our lives in a way that would glorify you. We pray that you would watch over and protect us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.